Okay, we're gonna talk about membrane transport and answer the questions, what is the cell membrane permeable and not permeable to, and what's the difference between diffusion and active transport? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So let's begin by talking about the permeability of the cell membrane. So to do that, first let's talk about the major ions in and outside the cell. There's a higher concentration of sodium ions outside the cell, and a higher concentration of potassium ions inside the cell because a cell is like a salty banana. We have on the outside some salt and on the inside a banana is known for its potassium. So a cell is like a salty banana. Outside the cell there's a higher concentration of sodium. Inside the cell there's a higher concentration of potassium. There. So outside salty E, inside banana E. Now what about chloride and calcium and bicarbonate? And it seems that all ions have a higher concentration outside the cell, except for potassium on the inside that's always bound to negatively charged anions like proteins and amino acids. Next, let's talk about the permeability of the cell membrane to various particles. And by permeability, we mean the ease of movement across the cell membrane. And so some uh, substances are fast, like small nonpolar molecules diffuse down their concentration gradients. They're very fast, like carbon dioxide, oxygen, those gases, or steroid hormones can go through a cell membrane, like estrogen and aldosterone. Um, they're like ghosts that move through a wall. Now, some things move slowly, like small polar molecules, some of them that they should not be able to diffuse through the cell membrane but they do, just very slowly. Water is the best example of that one, and urea in some places in the body. And then finally, there's some things that do not go this, through the cell membrane at all. The cell membrane is impermeable to charged ions like chloride, sodium, potassium, and, uh, and so forth, and also large molecules like proteins, insulin, thyroid-stimulating hormone, or glucose. Now, the cell uses the impermeability of the cell membrane for things like ions to actively generate gradients. So you have a high concentration of sodium outside, very little on the inside. So ions like sodium can have a very important role in cellular physiology because they build up this gradient. So how do the ions get in? Well, sodium ions are like you and I. Unlike a ghost that walks through a wall, we need a door to get through a wall. And we call these transporters, and that's how um, the, we make these cell membranes permeable. The permeability of a cell membrane can change by integrating channel or transporter proteins, like adding a door in a wall. Now, so let's talk about diffusion next. Now, diffusion means the random particle movement that produces a net flux down a concentration gradient, high to low. There's two types. Let's first start with simple diffusion. That's the movement of particles through a membrane down the concentration gradient, but there's no protein transporter. Nonpolar or uncharged or lipid-soluble molecules have high membrane permeability. So think of oxygen and steroid hormones for an influx, think carbon dioxide for an efflux. Driving force is the concentration gradient. Now the second part of diffusion is called facilitated diffusion, which is diffusion of particles through the cell membrane, but by way of a membrane protein, you use a door. And here are four different types of facilitated diffusion. Let's start with ion leak channels first. Uh, they're transmembrane proteins that form passages for specific ions to move down their concentration gradients. Here's a cell membrane, and the cell membrane's impermeable to charge ions like sodium. So what do we do? We put a door there. We call it an ion leak channel. Now sodium can diffuse down its gradient from one side of the membrane to the other. So ion leak channels are highly selective. This case it's sodium, but some are specific for potassium, calcium, and so forth. They're also called non-gated channels because leak channels are always open. So they're non-gated. Now voltage-gated channels are the next one, which are transmembrane pro proteins that open based on changes in the membrane potential that enable specific ions to move down their gradients. So here we have um, a cell membrane and it's impermeable to charge ions like calcium. So what we do is we put a voltage gated channel, but it's closed because at negative 70 millivolts, say a resting membrane potential, 
The voltage gated channel is closed, so calcium cannot move down its gradient from one side of the membrane to the other. However, if we then depolarize slightly that membrane, then that change in voltage causes that channel to open, and now calcium can move down its gradient from one side of the membrane to the other. A change in membrane potential enables that transmembrane protein to open, and specific ions, for specific, like in this case it's calcium, because it could be potassium or sodium, move down their gradient from one side of the membrane to the other. Now, what about ligand-gated channels? A ligand-gated channel is a transmembrane protein that opens in response to the binding of a chemical messenger. We call that a ligand. And it's enabling specific ions to move down their gradients. So here we have a ligand-gated sodium channel, and there's the receptor for a ligand. In this case, it's a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. With all the sodium on the outside, sodium cannot move through this channel because it's closed. How do we open it? We bind a ligand to it, which then causes it to open, and now sodium can move down its gradient. And usually with ligand-gated channels, an enzyme, in this case acetylcholine esterase, breaks that enzyme, and now the channel closes again. So ligands bind to this transmembrane protein, enabling it to open, enabling ions to diffuse down their gradient from one side of the membrane to the other. Now let's talk about carrier proteins, which are transmembrane proteins that carry specific molecules across the membrane by changing shape after the binding of the molecule occurs. So here is an example, it's called GLUT. And GLUT will take high concentration, will take glucose that's in high concentration outside of the cell. And once glucose binds, it changes the shape of GLUT and so now glucose is released to the internal surface of the cell. Glute can actually go both ways. And so when glucose binds to this transmembrane protein, changes shape, carries the glucose from one side of the membrane to the other. We see these in the small intestines, the kidney, the liver, pancreas, and so forth. Now a note on rate. The rate at which molecules can be transported by facilitated diffusion can never be greater than the rate the transporter proteins undergo as they change back and forth between their states or their number and their, their capacity. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, let's talk about simple diffusion first. We're going to show that by this membrane, but then we're going to graph it where the x-axis is the gradient and the y-axis is diffusion rate. And so what we see is there's oxygen will diffuse down its concentration gradient through that membrane and will continually diffuse until equilibrium's reach. So if we even increase and add more oxygen outside, oxygen will diffuse, and we add more, oxygen will keep diffusing. So if solutes, in this case oxygen, can move through the membrane by simple diffusion, there's no limit to the number, that, the number of oxygen molecules that can fit through the membrane. Therefore, the rate of diffusion increases linearly as more particles are added to one side of the membrane. Now let's talk about facilitated diffusion. So in the membrane, there are actually these transmembrane proteins to transport this blue solute or ion. Now what we see is that blue solute diffuses down its gradient until an equilibrium is reached. We see that, uh, we see that trajectory in the graph, but let's add more ions you see we're limited. All those ions can only move through those same three channels. So if we keep adding more ions, if the particles can only pass through, in this case, three protein channels, then the rate of diffusion is determined by the number of channels as well as the number of particles. Therefore, once channels operate at their maximal rate, a further increase in particle numbers no longer increases the rate of diffusion because the protein channels are saturated and you flatline, as what's shown in this graph. So another form of diffusion is called osmosis, where it's a process where water moves through a cell membrane, which is permeable to water, but not salts or sugars, from a less concentrated to a more concentrated solution, thus equalizing concentrations on each side of the membrane. Basically, water flows towards the saltier side of the membrane. To demonstrate this, here we have a picture where we see intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. But extracellular fluid has two compartments, the interstitial fluid between the cells and plasma, the fluid within the capillaries. So we now add shing solutes 
And what we see is that there's no net water movement because the solute concentration on this side is equal to the solute concentration on that side of the cell membrane. But now let's do this. Shing! We're going to increase the solute concentration in the extracellular fluid. And what happens? Water moves from inside the cell towards the saltier side of the membrane, which causes the cell to shrink um, because water leaves. Water moves through a cell membrane until the concentrations on each side of the membrane were equal on this side to this side. Water flows towards the saltier side. That's an important part of osmosis. Now we're going to talk about active transport, which is where particles move across the cell membrane with the help of a transmembrane protein against their concentration gradient and thus requiring cellular energy. Primary and secondary active transport are these two types. Let's focus on primary active transport first, which is the transport needing ATP to move particles against their concentration gradients. So here we have a cell membrane, and there we have potassium inside and more sodium outside. And we have something called the sodium potassium pump. And this is important because it utilizes ATP as an energy sort, source to transport ions against their concentration gradient. This is one of the most important um, uh, um, transporters in the body. It's like way important. I, I don't know why I just made my voice go high, but it's very important. So what it does is it takes three sodium ions that are inside the cell and then ATP binds and changes the conformational shape of the sodium potassium pump. And then the sodium now are on the outside. Now two potassium ions bind and through the uh, ATP, LA enables that two potassium ions to go inside the cell. So we notice that we're moving three sodium and two potassium against their concentration gradients. And if we do that, we need an energy source. We need ATP, okay? Now, secondary active transport is transport powered by energy stored in ionic gradients. And we move more than one particle at a time. There's two flavors, symporters and antiporters. Now, symporters are when one particle moves down its concentration gradient and enables another particle to move against its gradient, but both move in the same direction. So here's an example of that. There is a proximal tubule cell in the nephron, and this is the lumen or urinary side because it's filled with tubular fluid that will eventually become urine. And in the apical surface of this tubule cell is SGLT2, or the sodium glucose transporter. And so this is a symporter. What that means is it takes sodium in a high concentration in the tubular fluid and transports it into the cell where there's little sodium, so down its gradient, whereas glucose that's in the tubular fluid is transported against its gradient because there's lots of glucose inside the cell. So sodium moves down its gradient, glucose moves against its gradient, but part, both particles are moving in the same direction. That's a symporter. Now an antiporter in contrast moves uh, is where one particle moves down its concentration gradient and enables another to move against its concentration gradient dramatic pause, but both move in opposite directions. So here is a cardiac muscle cell, the interior of it, and there's the extracellular space, and that's the sarcolemma or cell membrane, which has in it the NC or the sodium calcium exchanger, NCX, which is an antiporter because it takes three sodium ions that are in high concentration outside the cell and transport them in while moving one calcium ion to the outside of the cell where there's a high concentration of calcium. So sodium ions move down its gradient, calcium moves against its gradient, both particles move in opposite directions. That's an antiporter. And that, my friends, is membrane transport in a nutshell.